<clears throat> right, good evening, everybody. It is now seven o'clock, and this is a meeting of the Executive of East Hearts District Council. Um, I'd like to welcome you all, um, either who are with us on the screen or those of you who are watching us on YouTube. You are almost right, good welcome. evening, everybody. It is now seven o'clock, and this is a meeting of the Executive of East Hearts District Council. Um, I'd like to welcome you all. Um, Well, some of you luckily had that twice. Um, right, so anyway, uh, agenda item one. I believe there are no apologies, is that correct? Thank you. Um, I would like to go around each of the members of the executive. Um, they will say what their portfolio is so that those of you who are watching will know um, who they are. So my name is Linda Hazy, and I'm leader of the council. Uh, Councillor Boylan. Hello, um, my name is Peter Boylan. I'm the executive member for Neighbourhoods. My portfolio includes responsibility for housing, um, licensing and community safety in its broadest terms. Thank you. Councillor Buckmaster. Good evening, I'm Eric Buckmaster. Uh, I represent Hunsdon Ward and I'm the executive member for Wellbeing. Councillor Cutting. Thank you. Good evening. My name is George Cutting. I'm the Executive Member for Corporate Services at East Arts District Council. I represent Bishop Stortford Central Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Goodeve. Good evening. My name is Jan Goodeve and I represent Castle Ward in Hartford and I'm the Executive Member for Planning and Growth. Thank you. Councillor McAndrew. Good evening, I'm Graham McAndrew, Southwell <coughs> Bishop Stortford and Executive Member for Environmental Sustainability. Councillor Rutland Barsby. Good evening, uh, yes, my name is Suzanne Rutland Barsby. I'm a Castle Ward member for Harford. My executive responsibility is communities, which include grants and all those areas or helping communities and partnerships. Also, I look after member support and training. Thank you. Councillor Williamson. Uh, good evening, I'm Jeff Williamson. I represent Little Haddon Ward and I'm the Executive Member for Financial St uh, Sustainability, which in also includes property. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so that was part of the uh, leaders' announcements, but I will now go on to make another few comments. Um, because we are virtual, I need to read this out so that we are fully aware of our legal status. Uh, the local authorities and police and crime panels, uh, brackets, coronavirus, coronavirus, brackets, flexibility of local authority and police and crime panel meetings, close brackets, open brackets, England and Wales, close brackets, Regulations 2020 came into force on Saturday, the 4th of April, 2020, to enable councils to hold remote committee meetings during the COVID-19 pandemic period. This was to ensure local authorities could conduct business during the current public health emergency. The meeting of the executive is being held remotely under these regulations via the Zoom application and is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. So on that statement, we do obviously mention COVID-19 <clears throat> and we should all be are very aware that it is still with us. Uh, we know that from um, Thursday, we will know which tier East Hearts and Hertfordshire will go into. At the moment, we have no idea what that might be, but whichever it is, we need to be very conscious that the virus is still with us and that we, every one of us needs to still completely obey the rules of keeping your distance, wearing a face covering when you're out in a shop or wherever you do need to wear it. Because otherwise <clears throat> we will see another major surge in what we um, have experienced in some areas and across the country. And we don't want that. We need to keep our, all of our population safe. I think um, the way that we will run this meeting is obviously uh, uh, members uh, who aren't on the executive, but who are still with us, um, 
you are more than welcome to ask questions. Please use the blue hand facility. Um, I will endeavour to keep an eye on them, but I know that Peter and Lorraine will also keep an eye on um, who's uh, raised a blue hand. Um, we have an extremely interesting agenda this evening. There are a number of papers uh, which are um, necessary for the council, uh, very exciting papers showing the way forward that we wish to go on. So without further ado, uh, let's now move on to agenda item three, uh, which is the minutes. These are on page uh, seven of the agenda pack going through to page 20. Um, I propose these meetings, Councillor Rutland and Barsby, will you second them please? Yes, thank you, Leela. I'm happy to second these minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> please can I ask the exec to raise their hand so it's visible on the screen if they approve the minutes. Okay. Is there anyone on the exec who is against the minutes or wish to abstain? Thank you. So those minutes are carried and will go through to council in the middle of December. We now move on to agenda item four, uh, which are declarations of interest. Um, do I have any declarations of interest from any councillors who are in this meeting? Okay, I wish to declare a declaration for agenda item uh, 11, which is on the ERDF funding for the launch pad. I'm a member of the LEP for Hertfordshire and I chair the European Structural Fund of which the ERDF is part of it. So during that discussion, I will be put into a separate room uh, and Councillor Goodeve will run that aspect of the agenda. Thank you. If we now move to agenda item five, uh, which is on page uh, 21 of your agenda list, um, this is the Sustainable Travel Town Bids, and I've asked Councillor McAndrew if he will introduce this paper, please. Thank you. Graham, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, Lido. Sustainable Travel Towns. East Hearts corporate priorities champion sustainability at the heart of everything we do, and that we will influence and encourage others to be more environmentally sustainable. As part of the Local Travel Plan, LTP4, adopted by Hertfordshire County Council, HCC have introduced criteria enabling Hertfordshire towns to bid to become sustainable travel towns. Meeting the criteria as it is currently presented will be challenging. However, <clears throat> the principle fits firmly with our ambitions for East Hearts Council, and I am recommending to full council that East Hearts Council supports the aspirations of LTP4 and the sustainable travel town criteria and support towns wishing to submit bids for sustainable travel town status. Thank you, Leader. Uh, open to questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor McAndrew. Um, again, these are aspirations, and we very much wish to support the towns in our district who want <coughs> to actually achieve um, some of this major way forward, and, and it's all part and parcel of our uh, green agenda and our commitment to ensuring that climate change is happening. Are there any comments or questions that anyone wishes to raise? Uh, Councillor Goldspink and then Councillor Crystal. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you. I just have a question on the report uh, 6.1, just to ask that apparently this bid to become a sustainable transport um, town um, was submitted on behalf of Bishop Stortford by the Shaping Stortford group. And now, um, I'm not quite sure about Shaping Stortford. Is it a committee of this council? Uh, does it report to the council? Or what is its remits and its authority for submitting this bid? And if it doesn't report to any council, um, any, any committee of the council, or indeed to the full council, 
could I ask that in future that it does report to a committee, possibly to overview and scrutiny, so that people who are not on that shaping stalkwood group would know what is going on? Thank you. Councillor McAndrew, can you take that one, please? Yeah, thank you, Lido. Shape and Stortford uh, group is uh, a group of people from uh, Bishop Stortford, the Bishop Stortford Civic Federation, bid members of uh, council, ca county councillors, East South District councillors, Bishop Stortford Town Council. And they've uh, come together for Shape and Stortford with Old River Lane and all the development that's going on there. And they are a separate entity from the uh, district council. But I think Helen was there at the onset. Uh, I wonder if Helen <coughs> wanted to sort of make a contribution. Yeah, no, that's fine, Graham. So um, as Graham said, the Shaping Stortford Group was initially set up in order to start to deliver the town centre planning framework that was developed by Allies and Morrison in 2016. So we don't, um, we don't lead so much on the Old River Lane site. There's a separate delivery board for that. So as Graham says, it's a group made up of a number of, of different parties, all of which have some sort of influence or responsibility within um, Bishop Stortford. The minutes, agendas, and any documents that we produce are all on the website for transparency. So anybody can have a look to see what, what's been going on on there. Um, and as far as putting in the bid goes, any internet entity at all could put in a, a, a sustainable travel town bid. So in where um, it was actually a developer that puts the um, bid in, in Hartford it was the town council, um, and in Bishop Stortford it just happened uh, to be the Shaping Stortford group that endorsed it. Um, but it could have been absolutely any, any group um, in any of the towns that put forward bids. All right. Is that okay, Councillor McGoldspink? You're on mute, Councillor McGoldspink. Um, yes, thank you. I'm, par I'm partially satisfied, but I would really prefer it if Shaping Stortford could possibly report to one of the Council's committees, um, possibly overview and scrutiny. Um, because, yes, I know lots of things are on the website, but sometimes they're hard to find. And I think it would be much more open and it would be better for democracy and transparency if the reports um, could come to one of the council committees. Well, we Thank will you. make sure that the link is sent to you, Councillor Goldspink, um, um, tomorrow so that you can find it directly on the, on the uh, website. Um, right. Councillor Crystal. You. Thank you, Leader. Um, yes, I had a, a question on the same, the same paragraph. Um, I see that Stortford was the only of the th only one of the three to be supported directly by East Hearts Council. And I, I get that the three towns are, are, are different. And I wondered whether um, officers have looked at the three towns and sort of uh, and have a feeling on whether East Hearts Council should be supporting one or other of them preferentially because it would have a better chance of. Um, of uh, achieving sustainable travel town status? That's a very good question, Councillor Crystal. <clears throat> the, uh, there's, I believe, 10 applications from towns across the county su submitted applications, and three are from East Hearts. And none of them have actually gone through the District Council. They've submitted them in their own right, which is really good because they've taken ownership of sustainability. <clears throat> it wasn't until about six weeks ago that we actually established, uh, I think Appendix A here, what the criteria was to actually become a sustainable travel town. So <clears throat> each of the towns submitted their application, not knowing what criteria they had to <laughs> sort of abide by. Now, there's a meeting of the Gripe at County Council in the first week of December which will determine which ones have been successful in going through to the next round. So where we are is that the criteria for sustainable travel towns is evolving by day. And there'll be, I don't know, maybe two, three, one, two, three that will get selected to go forward that County Council will actually work with. And for those who 
haven't been successful, I do believe at this time and moment, County Council will work with each of the applicants to get them further along the road if they can actually meet this criteria. Now, I think one of the things that we've got to do as uh, East House District Councillors, it's in our sustainability. We say we want to do these type of things. Once we understand what great uh, what decisions great make in a couple of weeks' time, I can sit down with Helen and say, look, Helen, this is where we are. We can sit down with each of the towns, understand what their application is and what we've got to do to offer assistance to get them onto the next rung of the ladder. Is that sort of uh, good enough or do you want more? No, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Okay. And Ben, just in case you hadn't quite worked out, Gripe is the infrastructure committee of the county council. Growth. Right. <laughs> I, I thought it was a comment about me. Uh, okay. <laughs> may, may I come in, Yeah. Yep. Yes. No, um, Councillor Buckmaster, I can see your hand, please. Thank you. No, I, yes, it's growth in infrastructure, planning and environment. But um, I think <laughs> the answer to the question is actually in the recommendations. So recommendation B says East Hearts Council will in principle support towns wishing to submit bids. So I don't think there's any preferential element here. I just think it's the different way in which they've approached it. So the idea is that in principle, they're all supported. <clears throat> okay, great. Any more, anything else on that one? No, in that case, please, can I um, take you to, uh, recommendations on page 21, A and B. Councillor McAndrew, will you propose, please? Yes, I'll propose. Okay, Councillor Goodeve. Peter, second leader. Thank you. Um, executive, please, can I ask if you will show a hand if you are in support of this recommendation? Okay. Anyone against? Um, Anyone abstaining? No, that's carried. Thank you very much indeed. Agenda item six, which is the review of the parking task, uh, task and finish force. And again, this is Councillor McAndrew, and this is on page 33. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Parking task and finish report. In 2019, the Overview and Scrutiny Committee set up a member task and finish group to consider parking matters. At its meeting on the 10th of December 2019, the Overview and Scrutiny Committee received a report from this group outlining its findings and recommendations for further consideration. This report was received by the Executive on the 11th of February 2020 with an additional recommendation that the authority be delegated to head of operations in consultation with the chairman of overview and scrutiny committee and chairman of the Par parking task and finish group and with myself as a portfolio holder for parking to assess the full viability of the recommendations and bring a further report to the executive setting out cost implications. Work has been carried out to review these recommendations in the context of cost, operational delivery, implications, and the objectives of the corporate plan. Updated recommendations have been categorized in the following way, complete, cease, monitor, defer, and refer. Now, prior to opening up for questions, and since the task and finish group commenced their work, COVID-19 has had a considerable impact on the parking throughout the district and the country at large. Commuters are no longer commuting, thus a mix of short-term and long-term parking has been impacted and the new norm will be different from the old norm. Shoppers are now doing more online and social distancing has also impacted on the usage in car parks. I would like to ask Jess, Head of Operations, to say a few words on the impact COVID-19 has had and the methodology of the report. Thank you, Leda. Jess, are you happy to do that? 
Yeah, happy to do so, Councillor. Um, so as Councillor McAndrews um, highlighted, COVID-19 has had a large impact on parking behaviour. Um, and we see that predominantly in long stay parking. So uh, occup occupancy in long stay car parking hasn't gone beyond 15% um, throughout uh, the initial lockdown in March uh, to where we are now. In terms of the recommendations in the report, we've taken a pragmatic approach considering what the new normal might be, ensuring that we don't invest too much money too soon in areas that we don't have certainty over. There's a number of elements that will be monitored and brought into officer work programmes, so those things will continue to happen. The RPZ um, revision of the policy is recommended to go to full council in December, and there's a handful of items, as I say, that we're deferring once we understand what parking behaviour looks like on a more long-term basis. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much for that. Um, Councillor Drake, um, you chaired this task and finish. Is there anything you'd like to add? Um, no, nothing I'd like to add, uh, only that we obviously had to make decisions around the categorisation of our aspirations from the initial task and finish report with the budget in mind, as well as the impact of COVID-19, but also bearing in mind that things do need to be future-proofed um, you know, way into the future recovery after COVID-19. So there was quite a lot to take into, into the consideration when putting this report forward. Yes, it's, um, <clears throat> it's suddenly become quite a different animal, hasn't it? Um, given the last, even the 12 months actually. Um, is, are there any comments or questions on this? Any blue hands? I can't see any. Okay, because these are quite complex recommendations, uh, we will not take them on block. We will take them A, B, C and D. Um, so I will read out the heading and then uh, Councillor McAndrew will propose and uh, Councillor Boyland hopefully will second. So on page 33, recommendation A is the findings of the review of the parking task and finish group recommendation, recommendations be received and considered. Councillor McAndrew? I, I propose. Okay. Well, I'm happy to second. Okay, great. Uh, everyone in favour of recommendation A? Good. Anyone against? Thank you. Recommendation B is to approve the cessation of the following recommendations within the task and finish group report. And I will read these out just so that we're very clear on what we're we're talking about. So rec recommendation B A is recommendation three, improve the accessibility and availability of short stay parking, including an increase to the number of limited parking, waiting free bays where possible throughout the town. B, this is, relates to recommendation D, uh, 10, support parish council the lobbying for an increase in the number of parking spaces in the station car park, which I assume is the one in Bishop Stortford, or um, recommendation C, which is number 17, the council to challenge station car park operators to reduce their charges to reflect closer to the all day charge in East Hearts town centre car parks. So that is for a cessation of those following recommendations from the task and finish group. Councillor McAndrew? Of course. Councillor Boylan? Leader, before we vote on this, can we just have clarity about which um, parish council and which station car park it is? I could see Holly, uh, Councillor Drake shaking her head when you asked whether it was Bishop Stortford, just for the record, so we're clear about what it is that we're... Yeah, sure. Councillor Wiley, I can see you. Uh, thank Would you, you like Chairman. To I, I, I believe, and I will look at Holly whilst I say it and see if she shakes her head, but I believe it's Watton at Stone. Okay, okay. can we just make a note of that? Yeah, that makes sense from the text. Okay, so can we just make a note of that, please, in that recommendation? Okay, and I'm um, happy to second that. Okay, and also, can I just ask some clarification on the C? on station car park operators. Is that all station car park operators across the district? Yes. Holly's, Holly, are you nodding? Right, so that's, again, that's just clarity. So proposed and seconded, um, all those in favor? 
all covered. Anyone against? Right, so recommendation C, which moves on to page 34, to approve the following recommendations for deferral. A, this is recommendation one, design and implement measures to encourage rail commuters to park in station car parks. B, recommendation 16, revise the designation of council-owned car parks. Councillor McAndrew? Propose. Happy to second. Okay. All those in favour? Great. Anyone against? Okay. Now on to D, to note that the following recommendations will be incorporated in service plans for officers to monitor, reporting sporadically, periodically, to the portfolio holder for parking. I think that really should say the portfolio holder for environmental sustainability. So that's recommendation two is revise the designation of council owned car parks. Recommendation six, review blue badge provision in council owned car parks. Recommendation nine, implement a permit parking scheme for town centre workers. Recommendation 11, lobby for improved cycle parking facilities and improved public transport. Recommendation 13, establish EV charging bays in East Hearts District Council car parks. Recommendation 15, implementing and lobbying for sustainability improvements, including solar canopies, on-street EV charging and car clubs. So this is a set of recommendations which are there to be monitored and reviewed periodically. Councillor McAndrew? Pause. Happy to second. Great. All those in favour? Thank you. All those against? Good. E. Refer the amendment in the re residential parking zone policy as described in paragraph 2.24 and appendix A to council for adoption. Councillor McAndrew. Pause. Happy to second. Okay, all those in favor? Thank you. Anyone against? Right, so those are all carried. Um, very often we get a paper that has to be has been revised as this one has but um i think these are good movements and good proposals going forward so i'd like to thank the task and finish group for what turned out to be quite a big task and um not quite finished um but we will get there in the end because um, lots of things are moving very quickly right if we now go to a uh, green waste policy which is on page 79 um Councillor McAndrew. Thank you, Leader. Waste alignment. Uh, Chairman, leaders, sorry, we, we're doing uh, item seven, which is on page 63, I believe. Um, yes, thank you very much indeed. So if we go to page 63, which is on shared waste. Thank you, Leader. Waste alignment, the shared waste service was formed in December 2017 in advance of the start of the shared waste contract with North Hounds. At the time the shared service was formed, an alignment of general policies in relation to collection services was undertaken, but an alignment of administrative functions and charging was not. This report seeks to create efficiencies within the shared waste service by aligning elements of waste and recycling services with North Hounds, our partner. In particular, in relation to pricing for services. This would include the introduction of new recycling opportunities for businesses as part of the commercial waste service. I therefore ask members of the executive to agree the recommendations regarding a common pricing structure in the shared service, with the introduction of charges in line with North Hearts for event waste management and the management of fly tipping at flats, as well as the introduction of a new commercial recycling service. I also ask that members agree to refer a decision 
to Council on the delegation of the annual charging decision to ensure charges remain aligned with the shared service on an ongoing basis. Thank you, Leader. Open to questions. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor McAndrew. Are there any questions or comments on this paper? Can't see any hands raised. No, neither can I. So in that case, um, there are five A, B, C, D and E on pages 63 and 64. Councillor McAndrew, are you happy to prevail? Propose, yes. Thank you. Um, and I'm seconding. Are there any, can I ask then please that the executive wish to approve this paper? Thank you. And anyone against? Okay, great. Thank you very much indeed. So we can now go to agenda item eight, which is green waste service, which is on page um, 79. Councillor McAndrew. Thank you, Leader. Garden waste. <clears throat> In January 2020, the option for charging for a garden waste service was approved at Council as part of the medium term financial plan. It identified an income of £400,000 for 2021. The coronavirus pandemic has also had a significant impact on all council budgets, and we are faced now with a greater challenge to balance budgets and enable us to deliver our statutory services as well as services to those who need them. The purpose of this report is to outline some of the detail around a proposed service setup. In order that we may go out to the public consultation during December, it seeks the views of residents on any changes to the garden waste service. A final decision is proposed at a January meeting of the council. We know and accept that any decision around charging for services, which have previously been free, is difficult for the public to accept. However, Garden waste is a non-statutory service which we do not have to provide. A charge service allows us to continue to provide this service to those residents who need it, without those residents who don't, such as those in flats paying for it through the council tax. We are not alone in our consideration of a charge garden waste service. The majority of councils in England who provide a garden waste service now charge for it. In particular, our, <coughs> excuse me, our Hertfordshire neighbours who charge include North Hearts, Well in Hatfield, Watford, Broxbourne, Three Rivers and St Albans coming on board as well. And not to forget our neighbours in Uttlesford and Essex, uh, Uttlesford District Council and Harlow. I ask executive members to agree the recommendation by approving the key principles of a chargeable garden waste scheme as highlighted in the report for the purpose of going out to public consultation prior to a decision on implementation by council. Thank you, Leader. Open to questions. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor McAndrew. Are there any comments or questions on this paper? Not at the moment, I don't think. I can't see any blue hands. No. Okay. Um, in that case, there are uh, one, just one recommendation, which uh, Councillor McAndrew has already read out, which is on page 79. Uh, Councillor McAndrew, um, happy to propose. Councillor Rutland Barsby. Thank you, Leader. Very happy to second this. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. All those in favour? Okay, thank you. So that is carried. Uh, agenda item nine, which is the Gilston Place Make uh, Gilston um, publication of the uh, community engagement strategy. Um, this, as you can see from the paper, is the strategy which will become part and parcel of one of the suites of documents 
projects used in the Gilston planning applications and going forward, and also through Garden Town. Uh, we believe that it is extremely important to uh, engage with our residents of all ages and demographics, um, both those who may wish to come and live in Gilston in the future, and also those who are already there. Um, and this makes a becomes a material consideration in the production of any planning application. So, and it is very much a collaborative document and has been worked with uh, very closely with officers and uh, residents through the Gilston Steering Group and the Neighbourhood Plan and the Parish Councils. Uh, I'm very happy to take any comments or questions on this. Uh, Councillor Buckmaster. Uh, thank you, Leader. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to second this. Um, I just wanted, if, if I may, make a few observations uh, on some key elements of the paper, if that's okay. Um, it is a very important paper, as you say. Uh, just a few things. On page 104 of the introduction, there is a reference to policy GA1 of the district plan and engagement through development of village master plans. Um, since then, we've also established the principle of strategic landscape master plans, which I'm sure will be dealt with in much the same way. Uh, there was a question that came up in the consultation on this paper in, on page 108 about community involvement on section 106 agreements. And the response correctly is that they are private agreements between local authorities and developers. Or I think it's probably also right to say that the community engagement or master planning process is an informative element in the shaping of these obligations. Um, and I'm also pleased to see there's recognition of the contribution of the neighborhood plan groups and parishes in there. Um, finally, something I know that's very important in all engagement with the community and stakeholders is the statement in 8.6 on page 125, which acknowledges the work of local groups. Uh, and it says the timing of engagement processes and consultations will need to be planned carefully to ensure enough notice is given having regard to holiday periods when people may be less available or have less time to participate. And it also goes on to say it will also be important to avoid multiple engagement processes taking place simultaneously, which can lead to the community being overburdened and less able to meaningfully communicate their views. Uh, so I think it's good to recognise that given the complexity and layers involved with the district, county, garden town and developers and more. So yes, Leader, I'm happy to second. Thank you. Mm. Excellent. Are there any other comments or questions from anybody? I can't see any blue hands. OK. Um, and this again dovetails into the policy that we put through uh, very recently on um, community engagement um, and recognising the role of different methods of communicating because of COVID. Uh, but actually are now becoming very important and will remain important. Um, so there are two recommendations on page um, 103, A and B, and I would ask all of you please to uh, raise your hand if you approve. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, the next agenda item is the Hertfordshire Growth Board. Uh, and Peter, I don't need to go into a breakout room at the moment because that's agenda item 11. I'm still only on agenda item 10. Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, so agenda uh, item 10, which is on page 137. The, we had a, a briefing on the Hertfordshire Growth Board given by the director of the board, um, Patsy Dell, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, one of the councillors said, good Lord, I thought this was going to be really boring, but actually it's really quite interesting. And I was very glad that actually that was recognised because Hertfordshire Growth Board can be a bit cringing, really, whether or not we're able to come up with a better name or not. I don't know. But at the moment, we live in the world of acronyms and um, it's uh, unlikely. But the Growth Board as you will see from the paper, has been in existence for the last couple of years. 
It comprises the 11 leaders of the authorities. Um, and we have worked extraordinarily and exceptionally well together. We cover all parties and we all have one very firm aim in what we are doing. And that is to make sure that the growth that is going to happen in Hertfordshire, both now and into the future, is smart growth, good growth, and that it is coordinated growth. And that the projects that we are putting, working together and which we will be submitting um, funding to the government on are ones which actually really will be and important to our residents. We've now got to the stage as the growth board um, that we need to uh, ensure the uh, transparency and the governance of the growth board. Uh, and this is what this paper does. Uh, it's the first step, it will go to council in December and it is to set up a joint, um, it's called a section 101 joint committee, uh, which will then have a stringent governance set around it and also to set up a, a parallel a scrutiny committee, again, with the members made up from each of the authorities and also the local enterprise partnership because part and parcel of the growth board is to ensure the economic growth of the county. Um, there are many plans which are being discussed at the moment on projects um, and we want to be in a position so that when funding is and becomes available, um, we have projects which are shovel ready or some other hideous phrase, uh, which we can then submit to government for funding. So I think I am very happy to propose this paper. Um, it's been a fascinating journey. Um, the leaders met roughly once a week for about six months, so normally at about half past eight, half past, um, eight o'clock in the morning, uh, often in East Hart's uh, council chamber, where uh, all of this was, um, as they say, thrashed out, but in a very, very positive way. So I'm very happy to make the recommendations A, B, C, uh, which are on and D and E and F and G, uh, which are on page 137 and 138. And I'm more than happy to take comments or questions. I can't see any. That's correct. So I hopefully can't that doesn't mean that everyone else finds it equally boring. You've muted yourself, Councillor Hazy. Councillor Goody, Eve. Can you second, please? Yeah, happy to second, Leader. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I ask for uh, approval of the recommendations? Okay, anyone against? No? Excellent. Great, great first stride forward. Uh, and then we go to Council. Right, um, this is now where I will be put into a room and Councillor Goodeve will take over the agenda item 11, which is on the ERDF funding of the launch pad. Good evening. Um, the ERDF funding has been secured by the Ministry of housing communities and local government for a three year project to support and expand launch pad in both Bishop Stortford and Ware and to support businesses. I'd like to thank officers for their hard work in pursuing the funding. Um, if there's any questions, um, I'm happy to have a go at answering them. If not, we'll go to the recommendation A, um, which is that subject to the outcome of a procurement process for awarding a uh, Jan, I think there was a question from Councillor yeah. Redfern. Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, this may be a silly question, but will this still be available after we leave Europe, this uh, grant? It's a three, we, we will have the funding for a three year project. Okay. Thank you, that's all I want to know, thanks. Thank you very much. You're welcome. 
So going to recommendation A, that subject to the outcome of a procurement process for awarding a contract for business support, the ERDF supported Launchpad 2 project proceeds. So I'd like to pro propose this. Do I have a seconder, please? Um, I'm happy to second, Councillor Goodeve. Thank you, Councillor Buckmaster. Um, could we now go to a, to a vote? Can the executive signal their support? Any votes against? Thank you. I think we can now let the leader back into our room. I actually got chucked out of my room a while back, um, <laughs> but I kept uh, very quiet and a low profile. Yeah, so. We didn't want to forget you. <laughs> You're very kind, kind Councillor Goodeve. Right. Um, agenda item 12, which is on page 193, which is um, the MTFP and oh, it's actually the budget. So Councillor Williamson. Okay, uh, thank you, Leader. Well, the preparatory work for next year's budget and our MTFP up to 2024 has now commenced. As we have become rather used to in recent years, we are starting with a sizable gap in our budgets. And this is despite the financial sustainability measures we have brought in over the last couple of years. Although arguably without these, our position would have been worse. The bottom line is that the gap for next year is 1 million, the same again for the year after, and a further 2 million for 2023 to 24. These figures represent additional savings required each year. So by the time we reach the year starting April 2023, our net revenue budget will need to be £4 million lower than it is now. So in September, we tasked the leadership team to delve deep within their respective services in order to devise proposals for savings which would meet these gaps. This was done most comprehensively and the results are contained in the 182 page document, which is Appendix A. Taking all the proposals in their totality actually exceeds the amount we need to save for the next two years. We have therefore reviewed all the options carefully and prioritized them into three groups as to which we would like to see taken forward. The result is a schedule given as Appendix B. And you can see from this that we are bringing forward just enough to meet the target for next year. However, there is still a gap of 200,000 for the following year and a significant gap remaining for 2023 to 24. I should point out though that these options are not cast in stone at this stage, but will be further refined as the budget preparation progresses over the course of the coming weeks. Officers will be undertaking a programme of further work as outlined in paragraph 4.7 of the report. This programme is to identify additional medium to longer term savings that can be achieved through a wider scale examination of the costs associated with the way the council currently operates. These may include, for example, efficiencies in procurement, analysing historic actual expenditure against budgets, and how the council could adapt to alternative ways of working, particularly in the light of the experiences forced upon us by the coronavirus. With regard to our capital scheme budgets, the council has previously considered these as a project total all in one year and then rolled forward budget provisions to reflect actual phasing. However, as we move to a position where existing capital resources are wholly allocated to current or imminent projects, and we will need to begin to borrow our funding for future schemes, this approach does not fit well with financing by a loan and the resulting revenue impacts. Therefore, the capital programme will now be presented as a rolling five-year programme, reflecting phasing over those five years and the resulting financing costs being reflected in the revenue account. Finally, since April 2019, we have by necessity complied with government's expectations 
that we would raise council tax by the maximum without triggering a, a referendum, which is five pounds on a band D equivalent household, which is just a shade under 3%. This raises roughly an additional 310,000 to the council per year, each year. Despite the proposals for savings, which I have just described, we will not be able to bridge the budget gap unless we do the same with council tax for next year and for each year within the MTFP. The report was considered by the Audit and Governance Committee at their meeting last week. My understanding is that they have not put forward any specific comments for us to consider. Therefore, I draw your attention to recommendations on pages 193, 194, which cover the four areas I've just gone through. I'll be very pleased to move these recommendations, though happy to take any questions before doing so. Thank you, Leader. One raised hand, Leader. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Redfern. Thank you, Leader. Um, the savings proposals that the executives are being asked to confer, the executives are being asked to confirm in the recommendations assume that the theatre will deliver an increased return of 400,000 um, 400, in 2023-24. This return hasn't been justified to my mind for the following reasons. The study of the Hartford Theatre project has only looked at balancing the books in relation to the development costs, but not in relation to possible long-term lasting changes in the first release model of films and changes in the way people view films after COVID. There has never been a, and the second point is there's never been a justification given for the uplift in predicted footfall from 120,000 to 143,000 when the figures were revised for an increase in costs uh, in 2019. But this increase has been used to justify the surplus, which is predicted. Could this uplift be justified now, please? And in connection with the footfall predictions, has the possible impact of new evening car park charges been considered? A possible new evening car park charges. Could these points be added to section 4.7 as they need to be addressed before it is possible to say that the plans are financially sustainable? Thank you. There's three questions there, really. Um, I think that it isn't quite clear that, um, that the theatre will make the predicted profit. Uh, that, has, that has not uh, convinced me at any rate. Thank you. OK, Councillor Buckmaster, do you want to come in on that? And then I think Councillor Williamson and also I can make some contribution. Thank you. Unmute, Councillor Buckmaster. Oh, sorry. I, I, I didn't hear my name being called. That's why I was waiting. Sorry to hold you up. Um, yeah, we've, um, we've undertaken the business case reviews on all of the capital projects, um, and I think they satisfied all of us that actually the, 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 um, all of the capital projects going forward would be viable. And, and don't forget, Hartford Theatre at the moment uh, has been a, a, uh, an entity that's been subsidised over a number of years, and what we're doing now is by improving it adding capacity to the theatre, adding cinemas, we're giving more opportunity for people to visit and come out. And I, I really don't believe that we need to be that pessimistic over the lifetime of the theatre that people are not going to want to socialise and, uh, and enjoy themselves as they did before. It might be too early to be really optimistic around the state of COVID, but we are beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel and I think all the indicators are that people will want to take part. So we're talking about going from a subsidy to better than break even. And there are so many um, factors involved with the three cinemas, increased capacity of the theatre, the, the cafe. I, I am absolutely confident that from a running start, it will be successful. And not only that, will also contribute greatly to the local economy. So it's absolutely the right thing to be doing. Thank you, Leader. 
Jeff, do you want to add anything to that? And then, uh, yes, if I may, or just to consider that uh, the impacts which uh, Councillor Redfern has referred to uh, really relate to 2022 onwards. Um, so not for the budget for this coming year. Um, and those impacts will be reviewed as, as we move forward. Um, obviously, this time next year, we'll be sitting down looking at the 2022 budget um, and we'll be, uh, you know, we will be more informed at that point. OK, um, thank you. I mean, I think there are a couple of points there you've, you've made, Councillor Redfern, if I just may address them. Um, I think there is a false cynicism out there that cinema won't ever come back because we've really all enjoyed watching an awful lot of very old series on Netflix and Amazon over the last six months. Um, but I think there are two points that actually evidence against that. One is as soon as the first vaccine from Pfizer was announced um, 10 days ago, I don't know if you noticed, but the share price of Cineworld and the other cine opera, uh, cinema operators shot through the roof because they realized that actually people do need to have a, uh, going to the cinema is an experience. It's not just watching a film on the sofa. I think the other thing that we need to be very conscious of is that actually Netflix was offered, uh, offered to launch the new James Bond movie for 350 million pounds. They said they'd pay that and they'd show the movie because obviously it's been de delayed. However, Netflix, um, their offer was turned down because the um, promoters of that film believed that when the time was right, everyone would go to the cinema to see the new James Bond. And I do believe that actually cinema has a very bright future. And when you do have enough um, uh, cinemas to actually offer the opportunity for having first releases, um, then you people will go. I think also just a little bit of history is um, when ten, over 10 years ago, um, Hot for Theatre was in my portfolio and there was a great deal of discussion about whether we should turn it from Castle Hall into what became Hot for Theatre. And I can remember going to a scrutiny meeting where there was a sort of, you know, bit of naivety, really, not naivety, sorry, that's the wrong word, where there was an, an element of... Um, well, we don't really want this. Well, where are we going to hold the mayor's tea party, for example? Um, and also the following day, the financial crash happened. So you could say that was the worst time ever to put in, at that time, it was over a million pounds to refurbishing Hot for Theatre. And it has just taken off. Um, we were very lucky that the film that was used um, to promote Heart for Theatre was uh, The King's Voice. So it was very, very popular and then set the standard for what then came afterwards. And I think also the pantomimes are sold out at the beginning of January. Obviously, that won't happen next year, but it uh, might probably won't happen this year either. Um, so I think we have to have... We know that people enjoy going to the theatre and the cinema. We know that Hart Theatre is seen as a great place to go. Um, and we need to um, ensure that what we're doing is looking forward to when the theatre reopens in 2023. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Councillor Redfern, do you want to come back? Yes, I, I do really, because oh, I've almost forgotten what I was going to say now. Um, could I uh, say that we have one policy about evening car park pricing that, that meets with another, that, 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 that has an impact on another, uh, the, the footfall? Um, but no, I'm sorry, I have forgotten what I was saying. There was a point I was going to make, which has gone out of my head now. Um, but yes, it's just that we are, we have not got the reserves that uh, historically that you had uh, in this council and we were, we're predicting borrowing in future years and we will be saddled with this debt in those future years as well and it's going to make a difference to ratepayers. I, I can't see any other way. I, it is going to make a difference to ratepayers. 
it's not that I don't want the um, alteration and the improvement, but it is such a very large amount of money and a very large debt. And, and that's all I, I can say. I just think we should think once, twice and three times before committing ourselves to such a very great expenditure when uh, we know that we're going to have a very hard five years at least in front of us. Thank you. Okay, I think we're actually council taxpayers now, Council Redfern, not tax and not um, um, rate payers. Um, Councillor Williamson, I don't know if you want to comment on that or if in fact what we can do is um, there will be further discussion on this at a later date. I've got Master had his hand raised, and if he wants to come in. Thank, thank okay. you. I, I was Eric, do you want to come in, back? Yes, yes, just in response to that. Um, apart from creating great facilities for the uh, for the residents, it actually is to the benefit of residents. Hardly. Because Hardly. I can't, I'm not sure why you're shaking your head when the project will go from one of subsidy to making a return. And that actually has a positive return on the uh, on the finances of the council, and that's for the long term. So that's an absolute plus. So we've got it both ways. Thank you, leader. Okay. I'm only going to say much the same thing. I'm um, looking at it from a financial perspective. Um, you know, the, the fact that we're going to be moving from a subsidy to uh, income is, is you know, so important for the position we're in currently. Much has been made of that, but um, uh, with all the other variables, I'm not sure that that is, you know, we, well, you know, we won't have to pay that subsidy, but some of that subsidy is based on a debt that I believe has already been paid. Some of the subsidy that you have been paying hitherto has already been paid off, I, I believe. So that subsidy is not as great as it has been, have we, as we have been led to believe. Anyway, I don't want to hold up the meeting any further. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm sure um, uh, this will be revisited at a further time. Are there any other comments or questions from anybody? No, okay. Now there are A, B, C, D, uh, four recommendations, which are on page 193, 194. Um, Jeff, Councillor Williamson, are you happy to propose? Indeed, yes. Okay, um, and I will second. Um, all those from the executive are, are in favour. Great. Anyone against? Okay, good. Thank you. We now move on to page 397. Oh, it's a good job we've gone paperless these days, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, which is agenda item 13, uh, which is the quarterly corporate budget monitor quarter, 2nd of September. Councillor Williamson. Uh, thank you again, Leader. Um, well, this is a second monitoring report for the current financial year, covering the period July to September. As we will all appreciate, we've been going through a time of considerable financial uncertainty for the Council through the COVID lockdown, with many of our core funding streams being affected badly. Earlier indications suggested that the Council would have to use significant amounts of its financial reserves to cover these losses. However, the various forms of government grant support announced over the summer have meant that the overall impact is now much less than previously envisaged. And as will be seen from the report, we now predict an outturn for the year with an overspend contained to just 168,000. The various overspends and underspends by service are included in the report with some commentary. However, it needs to be remembered that these figures are net of the government funding, which has been provided to support COVID related losses. In relation to our capital projects, as will be seen from Appendix A, many budgets have been reprofiled due to the COVID-19 restrictions and delays. And this has resulted in just over 20 million of this year's 70 million pound budget now being forecast to be carried over for future years. Uh, the two recommendations are A and B on page 397, which I'm pleased to move, Leader. Thank you very much. Um, are there any comments or questions on this aspect of the budget? Can't see any blue. No, I can't. 
No, neither can I. So, um, uh, Councillor Boylan, are you happy to second this, please? I'm very happy to second this recommendation. Thank you, uh, Executive. All those in favour? Great, thank you very much indeed. So that's carried. Um, so now on to Treasury Management, which is on page 415, Councillor Williamson. Thank you. Uh, the Council is required to produce an annual Treasury Management Review of activities and the actual credential and Treasury indicators each year. This has been undertaken and Appendix A contains a full review and outturn report. This is quite detailed and all we are being We'll, all we are being asked to do tonight is agree that this can be taken forward to full council, subject to any comments. Otherwise, I'm pleased to move the single recommendation on page 415. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Are there any comments or questions on this paper? No. Uh, Councillor Rutland Barsby. Thank you, Leader. Very happy to second this. Thank you very much. Executive, all those in favour? Great, thank you very much indeed. Now on to page 441, which is the Treasury Mid-Year Review. Councillor Williamson. Well, thank you. Well, this is very similar to the previous item, but covers the Treasury Management Mid-Year Review for the current year. I would ask you to note that there are several references in the report to period 19 to 20, but these should read 20 to 21. Again, Appendix A contains the review. And as before, we're being asked tonight to agree that this can be taken forward to full council, subject to any comments. I would draw the executive's attention to the third recommendation, which is to raise our county party limits with the bank from 20 million to 30 million, which was brought on or has been brought on earlier this year by the rather unusual circumstances of receiving a very large lump sum of government funding for the COVID related business support grants, which briefly exceeded the current limit. So I'd like to move this and the other two recommendations together being A to C on page 441. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions on this? No. Okay, Councillor Buckmaster. Have we to second? Can you please? second? Okay, thank you. Executive, all those in favour? Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, agenda item 16, which is on page uh, 471. Um, this is a report from the chairman of the Overview Scrutiny Committee. Um, Councillor Wiley, would you like to say a few words, please? Uh, thank you, Ch thank you, Chairman. Um, I have pleasure in moving the report on the Overview and Scrutiny Committee held on the 24th of November. There is one recommendation for your executive um, I'm happy to answer any questions if any members have them. Okay, are there any comments or questions on this? No? Okay, and I'd like, like to thank you, Councillor Wiley, for the uh, courtesy that you showed uh, Richard and I when we came to present um, uh, the COVID report at your committee, so thank you. No, th thank, thank you, Leader, and thank you to Richard and all the officers. It was an extremely informative um, meeting and uh, very, very timely as we went into lockdown about 24 hours later. <laughs> yes. Always like to get our timing right, but um, hopefully um, we'll see where we end up on Thursday. OK, so um, you're presumably happy to report this and I'm very happy to second this. Uh, this is a report to note. Uh, all those happy to note it? Yes? Great. As far as I can tell, I have not been advised of any urgent business. So in that case, the meeting is it's closed. Councillor Pope, sorry. Uh -huh. Thank you. So this is a, just a, a brief report on the last meeting of the Audit and Governance Committee, which met on the 17th of November. Uh, the committee received a very useful update on the proposed legislative changes and policy implications for section 106 outlined in the government's consultation on the planning for future white paper which came out in august 2020 the council's section 106 officer also provided an update on what section 106 monies could and could not be used for the committee received assurances that developers were being chased for any monies outstanding 
and that deadlines were being adhered to, which included contacting ward members and working with the county council and other agencies in order to achieve good value for money and also to obtain advice on how any monies might be applied. Contributions in lieu of funds in relation to affordable housing were explained and also where these funds were held. The committee continues to feel that receiving regular updates on section 106 is very useful and another such update has been agreed for, for the next uh, civic year. Committee reviewed also reviewed the council's strategic risk register, the 2019-20 Treasury Management Outturn and the Media Treasury Management Review Update. The committee also received an update on the council's budget covering the quarter ended September 2020 where it was noted that there was a projected underspend of £168,000, which has already been explained by Councillor Williamson. The committee also noted the reasons for this. The committee also received a presentation on the Council's budget for 2021 and 22, and the medium-term financial plan 2021 to 24. Members noted that all members had received a presentation at the members' information session in August 2020 that set out the financial challenges the Council faced to set a balanced budget over the medium term. As Councillor Williamson has already explained, uh, the committee noted that the council needs to identify reductions in net cost of a million pounds in 21-22, a similar figure in 22-23, and a further two million pounds in 23-24. The total reduction in net expenditure amounted to four million pounds to be achieved by 22-23, representing a 26% reduction on the 2020-21 net budget of some 15 million pounds. Executive, uh, it was noted that the executive had tasked officers to prepare a range of options to reduce net expenditure for early member consideration. And the committee noted that these form part of the report that the committee was uh, reviewing. It was noted that all the options would continue to be considered and further refined over the next couple of months or so in light of the emerging COVID-19 situation. It was also noted that the council's leadership team uh, had, a had set out a further programme of work to be undertaken to deliver a financially sustainable council by 2024. But the council reviewed the papers uh, before it and, uh, and it noted that a detail that uh, they would be de subject to a detailed impact assessment and, th and that it also accepted a number of the, of the uh, proposals might need to be reconsidered in light of the current pandemic. The committee endorsed as guidance to officers that the budget proposal should be based on a council tax increase of five pounds, a general inflation, inflation assumption of up to 1%, and that the provision for the national pay award would be up to 2%. The committee endorsed the production of a phased capital programme over five years to better reflect the actual phasing of delivery and a more realistic revenue impact of the capital financing pro programme. It further endorsed that an additional programme of work would be undertaken to, transfer, to transform the council and to place it on a financially sustainable footing. The committee agreed that um, as, as the, the, uh, these proposals were ongoing, that they would be considered again by a joint meeting of the council scrutiny committees to be held in January 2021. That, that, con that concludes my update, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Pope. Um, I did watch most of your meeting and uh, it, was, um, it was a very good meeting. So uh, lots of good stuff and uh, good questions came out of it. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, are there any comments or questions for Councillor Pope on the last audit and governance meeting? No, okay. I'm happy to uh, second your verbal report and, um, and it is now noted, so. Are there any other comments or questions? No, in that case, um, I close the meeting at um, 2014. Thank you very much all for coming and for your attention and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.